<laughs> Today we'll be talking about a man who certainly is the, the founder of Western monasticism and uh, monasticism even today, uh, 1400 years later, is still based on this man. He wrote the foundational document of Western monasticism, which we'll be talking about today, and it really is also a foundational document for Western Christianity, and it's called the, the Rule of St. Benedict. And so we'll be talking about Benedict himself today, and we'll be talking about the rule that he wrote. He was a Italian monk. He was from a town called Nursia, and you can see he lived from about 480 to 550. And there's some argument about when he started his, uh, his monastic life. Uh, most people guess it was around 500 or a little after 500. So he was a pretty young man. He was maybe 19 or 20, 21 years old. And to have somebody that young uh, have so many followers uh, and, and to start a movement which 1,500 years later still exists is, is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, Gregory the Great, the guy who came up with plain chant or Gregorian chant, Pope. Pretty much everything we know about uh, St. Benedict comes from Gregory the Great. And Gregory the Great didn't really write a biography of Benedict the way that Athanasius wrote a biography of St. Anthony. He was really more focused on the spiritual impact of Benedict, but in this work that he wrote we are the only biographical details uh, uh, that we know. So according to Gregory the Great, uh, Benedict started his monastic career by living in solitude in a cave at Subiaco, Italy, 30 miles east of Rome. And like so many others who have done similar things, and St. Anthony was another one, uh, Pelagius in uh, uh, Augustine's time would have been another one. They were shocked by the paganism, by the licentiousness they saw in Rome, and they were reacting to that, uh, that, that paganism and, and licentiousness. So he reacted to it by essentially disappearing into a cave for three years. We should mention a couple things about this, though. Um, first off, there already were Western monasteries at the time he disappeared into the cave. It's just that they were scattered and they had no unifying theme. Uh, so it, it, in the strict sense, he didn't found Western monasticism. There were already uh, monasteries in the West at that time. What he found was a unifying force that tied the monastic movement together and helped make it great. Also, in those three years that he was living in the cave, he didn't live in complete solitude the way St. Anthony did when St. Anthony started out uh, his ministry. He actually uh, became friends with the abbot of a local monastery, and the abbot from time to time would come to visit him, or Benedict would go to visit the abbot. And the thing the abbot later commented on that he was shocked that in someone this young is how much this young man seemed to know about human nature. That he seemed to have a very, very good understanding about human nature. And this is significant because the thing that made the rule of Benedict so powerful and so influential and still used on a daily basis 1,500 years later is that it does understand human nature. It does not attempt to uh, make a monastic life so difficult that hardly anybody could actually do it. Uh, it is not a monastic life that's strictly focused on, on prayer and, and research uh, with no work. It's a mixture of, of prayer and research and work. So it, it, it really has a, a marvelous understanding of human nature. Um, in time, other monks asked him to be their leader. So again, a local monastery, the abbot died. And the monks came to Benedict, who they knew was living in this cave, and they said, we want you to be your abbot. Well, he was familiar with his monastery, and he said, I don't think you guys are going to like me as your abbot. So I think this is a bad idea. And they said, no, 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 we took a vote. You won unanimously. We want you to be the abbot. So he said, OK, we'll try it. 
within six months. They tried to kill him, didn't they? They tried to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> within six months, they tried to kill him. And supposedly, supposedly his first two miracles is they tried to poison him uh, with his drink. And as he reached for the cup, According to his first miracle, the cup shattered so that he could. And then they tried to poison him with a loaf of bread. And according to the legend, his second miracle was that a bird came down and grabbed hold of the bread and, and flew off with it. So these are the first two recorded miracles. So Benedict was right. They were probably not the right match for him as the abbot. But in fact, moving past that, he eventually started 12 monasteries of 12 monks each in the area, and that is really his start, because now he's not taking over for somebody else in an existing institution. He is creating a brand new institution, and that's the foundation of Western monasticism as we know it. Uh, around 529, Benedict founded the monastery of Monte Cassino, Italy, 80 miles south of Rome. This is the most famous monastery that he founded. It still exists today. It's featured in a James Bond movie. Uh, and and the one they just bombed the smithereens, too. In, in the World uh, yes, during the World War II. That's true. Uh, but this is a very famous monastery. And around this time, so by this time he's 49, 50. Uh, when he founds his greatest monastery, the Monte Cassino. But more importantly than founding that monastery is around the same time, Benedict sits down and writes his famous rule for monastic life. The rule would be the basis for most Western monasticism for the next thousand years, and is still used today by the Cistercian, by the Benedictines, by the Trappists. So this is his most influential writing. It's a document in terms of its influences on the same level as Aquinas' Summa Theologica or, or uh, Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, uh, Augustine's Confessions or City of God. This is a, a very powerful document, and we're going to spend...